Greetings, fellow mathematicians. We're gonna take a look at the divergence test and everything that you need to know about it. Now, I've always found students have several misconceptions about the divergence test. So, we'll take our time. We'll split this into two parts. The first part will be applying the divergence test to two simple examples. And then in the second part, we'll really get into understanding what the divergence test does and does not tell you about the convergence or divergence of an infinite series. So before we get to the examples, let's just understand what the divergence test is. We always start with an infinite series and we're gonna denote the term of the infinite series as a sub n, pretty standard notation. Now the divergence test, like all mathematical theorems, has two parts, there's some conditions, and then there's the conclusion. The conditions for the divergence test are related to the limit of the term, a sub n, and the conditions are if the limit of the term a sub n either does not exist or is not zero, then you get this conclusion that the infinite series with the term a sub n diverges. Now this is a really nice test because what it does is takes a conceptual problem, determining if an infinite series converges or diverges, and it converts it into a simple calculation. We just take a limit as n approaches infinity of the term a sub n. And at this point in the calculus sequence, we have a lot of tools for limits. So with that, let's jump to the two examples. The first one, we have an infinite series from one to infinity where the term is 2n plus one divided by 3n plus two. Let's immediately take a limit of the term as n approaches infinity. So limit as n approaches infinity of 2n plus one divided by 3n plus two. This does give you an indeterminate form of type infinity over infinity. So you can apply L'Hopital's rule. It'll go really quick. You could also notice that your powers of n in the numerator and denominator are equal, in which case the limit should be the ratio of the leading coefficients. Either way, you'll find this limit comes out to two thirds, and that is definitely non-zero. All right, now let's check our conditions from the divergence test. And there's two of them. Either the limit of the term does not exist or the limit of the term is non-zero. And we have that, our limit is two thirds. That is non-zero, so the conditions are met. So we get the conclusion. And the conclusion is that the infinite series here from one to infinity of that term, or with that term, two n plus one, divided by three n plus two, the conclusion is that infinite series diverges. And again, we reach that conclusion because the conditions of the divergence test are met. All right, now the next example points out some misconceptions and errors in applying the divergence test. This one is a little bit simpler. We have an infinite series from one to infinity where the term is one over n squared. All right, we'll immediately jump to taking a limit of the term. So limit as n approaches infinity of one over n squared. And unlike the previous one, this does not give you an indeterminate form. This just has the denominator getting bigger as n goes to infinity. And we have this basic idea that one over a big number should be small. So this limit is gonna come out to zero. Now let's check if this matches either of the conditions for the divergence test. One of the conditions is that the limit of the term does not exist. Well, this limit does exist since the term 
approaches a single finite number. All right, so we don't worry about that one. That's not satisfied. The other one is the limit of the term is not zero. And well, we found here the limit of our term is precisely zero. So the second condition, that's not satisfied or met either. And what happens here in this case, since the conditions are not met, the divergence test does not give us this conclusion. In other words, the divergence test is inconclusive for this example. All right, now there's a common misconception here where the limit of your term equaling zero, the misconception is that then implies that the infinite series converges. And that is not true in general. Now, as it turns out, this infinite series does converge. The easiest way to see that is with something called looking at it as a P series, which might be getting to in a little bit. But make sure you realize the divergence test tells you nothing about whether this infinite series converges or diverges. In other words, the divergence test is inconclusive for this example because neither of the conditions are met. Now, let's go ahead and get to what the divergence test does and doesn't tell you, which we kind of already outlined here, but we'll take a look at it from a simple starting place and then how we understand at a more technical level conditions and conclusions for various mathematical theorems. To really understand what the divergence test tells you, we need to take a look at it from the point of view of a mathematical theorem or logical statement. So let's start first with the basic form of a logical statement. P implies Q, where we're gonna call P the conditions, and Q, we're gonna call that the conclusion. Now the statement or theorem that we're gonna start with to lead us to the divergence test is this theorem here, which states that if an infinite series converges, then the terms of that infinite series, the limit of them, has to equal zero. Now at an intuitive level, that makes sense. Basically, if an infinite series is going to converge, that can be interpreted as saying that the terms have to gradually get smaller, approaching zero. If the terms of an infinite series gradually get bigger, there's no way that infinite series would converge. So I think this makes sense. Now, not everyone in my course is going to go on to become a math major or even continue in the sciences or engineering. So instead of starting with a theorem, let's parallel that with a basic logical statement. If you're in New York City, then you're in the United States. And I've always found Understanding the structure of a theorem in terms of more basic examples helps students to really get how to switch and work with theorems and logical statements. All right, now the first kind of rewritten version of this, we have P implies Q. If we switch the conclusion and the conditions we get something that's known as the converse. So instead of P implies Q, we have Q implies P. And that's not true in general. Now, it's most easily to see that by looking at your basic version here. This is true. If you're in New York City, then you're in the United States. But the converse of that, if you're in the United States, then you're in New York City, that is not true necessarily, or it's not true in general. And the same applies here. If we switch our conditions with the conclusion, this is not true. If the limit of the term equals zero, then the infinite series converges. That is not true in general. And the primary 
counter example that proves this false is the harmonic series. All right, so first make sure you realize if this is your statement, the converse is not true necessarily. All right, and I think that's easy to see here. A little bit harder to see that here, but if you're on top of what infinite series are in this part of your Calc 2 course, I think you can understand that as long as you have some basic examples like the harmonic series in mind. All right, so if we have our statement and this result called the converse, which is not true in general, there is an equivalent version or a statement that is logically equivalent to this, which is called the contrapositive. And what the contrapositive does is it takes the conditions and conclusion, it switches them, but it negates them. So in other words, instead of P implies Q, we switch it and negate, and what we have for the contrapositive is not Q implies not P. And as it turns out, your statement and the contrapositive, those are logically equivalent. In other words, the statement and the contrapositive say the same thing. Now, let's understand that first with our basic versions here. Remember, our statement was, if you're in New York City, then you're in the United States. And that is true. All right, let's go ahead and switch and negate. So in other words, if you're not in the United States, then you're definitely not in New York City, and that is certainly true. So in other words, this statement and the contrapositive say the same thing, but be careful what we call the converse. This is not true in general. Now let's go ahead and apply our statement converting to the contrapositive to our theorem. And if this is our theorem or statement, the contrapositive switches that. So in other words, it says, if the limit is not zero, or since this limit exists, the limit not existing could be the limit does not exist. So if the limit is not zero or does not exist, then the conclusion we reach reversing and negating, not converging, is diverging. So if this is your theorem or statement, this, that is the contrapositive, and that, that is the divergence test. And make sure you can understand it by paralleling it, your theorem with this basic statement, and then the divergence test with this basic result. Remember, these are what we're calling the contrapositive. Those are going to always be logically equivalent to the statement. So really try to understand this, first probably with these, and then try to understand it in terms of the mathematical theorems here. All right, I hope that helped. This is gonna be extremely beneficial to those of you continuing into higher level mathematics, science or engineering, where you start to encounter kind of more complicated looking theorems. I find it really helps to understand things right now in calculus two at this level, because it's going to build on from here. I hope you enjoyed the video. Hope you learned a lot, and especially what the divergence test does and does not tell you. If you enjoyed the content, support the channel, like and subscribe.